On this episode of Old Joe's Reminiscence, when the Star Lost Trio enters a random biosphere, they get caught up in a psychological experiment that could have deadly results. Simon Oakland guest stars. Well, I certainly hope this review goes better than my last one, which took weeks to finalize. My easy-to-use video editor just up and disappeared after a recent Windows update. I had no icon, no file folder, not a single trace that it had ever existed. Reinstallation attempts failed too, so I tried several newer programs before settling on the one I'm using now. The one that I liked the best was far too expensive for my limited budget. Then, once I'd committed, I got about half of my Episode 5 review edited before it became sluggish and buggy. It's a good thing that I'd decided to save a partial copy because after proceeding to edit the entire review, it threw a hissy fit and failed to save that. Well, I discovered that others have reported that same problem with no solution. I was almost ready to give up at that point, abandoning this channel, but I redid that last half with quick edits and expedited the project. Anyway, if you are viewing this video, then I must have found some way to avoid more errors and continue editing. Sometimes we have to work through adversity as shown in this episode, and only man is vile. We open the episode with our three heroes, Devon, Rachel, and Garth, being watched by a video surveillance. Yes, I think they'll do very nicely indeed. The man watching them is an actor I immediately recognized as Simon Oakland. He played General Moore on the 1976 NBC World War II drama series, Ba Ba Black Sheep. It's better known today by its syndicated moniker, Black Sheep Squadron. Simon Oakland was born Isidore Simon Weiss in Brooklyn, New York on August 28, 1915. He was a concert violinist before turning to acting as a career. Like many others he started out on the stage. Simon made his film debut in the 1958 film I Want to Live. He played a lot of tough guys over the years. He had several recurring roles, and appeared as a regular in Toma, Kalshak the Night Stalker, and Black Sheep Squadron. He maintained residences on both coasts so he could fly back and forth for roles in Hollywood or the New York Theater. Simon Oakland died of cancer on August 29, 1983, one day after his 68th birthday. A woman is watching with him. She's Irena Majewska, a Polish-born Canadian actress who appeared in a few dozen productions. She seemed to disappear from the screen altogether in the early 1980s, around the time she got married, causing me to wonder if there's any connection. As we've been following our three, I think most of the domes were given names up to this point. This one is merely labeled Biosphere 14, using the Roman numeral for 14. <laughs> Do you suppose Earth was once like this? I don't know. <laughs> Cara Delay is not as stiff as he used to be. Maybe he's growing into his role as Devon. It's certainly a far cry from Cypher's Corners. Yeah, too far, I'd say. What's this, Leisure Village? Well, I suppose people had to rest sometime. Well, they probably came here. 
where every prospect pleases. The only man is vile. Garth pushes ahead and the other two follow onto the blue screen. I think I would have cut that crude special effect and merely dissolved from them leaving the monument to them approaching the building. Simon Bar Sinister and Irena are still watching the video feed. They've apparently waited hundreds of years for this opportunity. Are they on the anti-aging serum, I wonder? Devon can't find a place to stick his key in, but the door opens anyway. He's a little apprehensive about entering, but they cautiously walk through the door. It closes behind them. That's ominous. The set dressers must have gotten a real super bargain on that ubiquitous lime green egg crate mattress foam. Because it appears all over the place on the ark. From the landing pads, the doormats, seat covers, mattresses, you name it, it's everywhere. The three wonder where everyone is. Garth decides to scout around. He wanders down an empty corridor and into a room where he finds a table set with food and drink. As he stands there pondering, he hears what sounds to me like whimpering. The camera pushes in on a camera hidden in the wall. Simon Oakland announces that the three are ideal specimens and he addresses Irena Majeska's character as Dr. Tabor. Garth continues searching the corridors until he comes to a door that's partially open, or partially closed depending on your viewpoint. There's a young woman crouched against the wall, sobbing. She is Canadian film and television actress Trudy Young, who would have been familiar to many Canadian viewers. She had a recurring role as Susan Eau Claire on 35 episodes of Strange Paradise, and she was Helga on the concurrently running series George, both on Canadian television. A bit of trivia for her, her voice can be heard on Pink Floyd's The Wall album. Oh my God, what a fabulous room! Are all these your guitars? This place is bigger than our apartment. Can I get a drink of water? You want some? Watch. Hello? Trudy's last screen appearance was in 1982 when she apparently retired from acting after being nominated for Best Actress in that year's film Melanie. Garth pushes the door open and he enters the room. He asks her some questions, tells her who he is and where he's from, but he gets no response from her. You afraid of me? Where is everybody? When he sits next to her and extends a hand, she flinches and bats it away. Look. you're well enough to defend yourself. He continues firing off questions. She eventually reaches out to him and she collapses into his strong arm. As he carries her from the room, there's another camera push to another wall-mounted camera, and then we cut once again to a smiling Simon Oakland. When we join our three back together again, the young woman is on a bed. 
Rachel is dabbing a cloth to the woman's sweaty forehead. Why don't you look around a bit more? Rachel introduces herself. She asks the woman's name, but she appears to be unable to speak. Rachel continues asking questions anyway. When the men return, they discuss what to do. They don't want to leave the young woman there alone, but they also can't take her with them. They'll wait until they find out what's going on. If I can break them within 48 hours, will you then finally agree that my view of the human beast is more realistic than yours? Wherever they're from, they've had some ethical programming, aside from being friends since childhood. Precisely. Those others were a contemptible lot to begin with. Soft, feckless, cruel, every man for himself. But these three, if I can turn them into strangers, each concerned only for his own survival, what will you say then about the nobility of human nature, about the myth of man created in some divine image? I think you will fail this time, Dr. Asgard. We start Act 2 with the two doctors in a long conversation meant to give us exposition about their motivation. If we are to breed a race of people capable of adjusting to the harsh environment whatever planet the Ark sets down on... Then we must program every hint of softness out of them. Everything except the raw instinct of survival. You still don't agree with that aim, even though you've worked here for years. Knowing this biosphere was established for precisely that purpose. Dr. Asgard, this institute, the whole concept of Leisure Village was to help the people of the Ark, not to prove your theories of human behavior. Dr. Asgard presses a button and the woman immediately attempts to speak. She struggles to say, Letha. Sort of like Lisa, if you're Sylvester Puttitat and have a sweet impediment. <laughs> Letha. Your name is Letha? Can you tell us about your people now? Others? You mean others drove them away? <laughs> How on earth did Rachel come up with others drove them away? I'm also not buying Devon's sudden change in demeanor, pushing her for answers and accusing her of holding something back. That's just not like him. Sure, I know she's holding back, but it shouldn't be that obvious to him. Lisa. Lisa. Are you holding anything back that we should know? Look, stop pushing her, will you? Can't you see she's scared to death? No. I think she's holding something back. Devin, you have to be patient. She's still not recovered. I think she knows something. If you're so impatient for answers, why don't you ask those who ran away? If I can find anyone. So this has me wondering, did whatever button Dr. Asgard pressed control her vocal cords or signal her to speak? Or did it somehow start some ultrasonic sound or other outside irritant that's working to affect all of their nerves? I just can't think of any other reason for Devon, Rachel, and Garth to start arguing with each other so suddenly. Yourself. The 
Against what? Them. Against them? Who's them? Your friends. So, Letha is a knowing part of the experiment. She's there to put a wedge between the other three. Our snake in the Garden of Eden, Diana. Phase one. All the time I'm wondering how those doctors would even get visitors to their dome to run their experiments. Where did the last group come from? Devin finds one of those information portals. He grabs the chair cushion, expecting to hear, Can I help you? But this portal seems to be dead. Devin sits down and starts pressing buttons, but there's still no response from William Osler, even though he's credited on the episode. I guess that's because he does record the opening narration. Letha appears in the doorway wearing that mini dress and go-go boots. Oh, how I love early 1970s fashions. She can talk normally now, it seems. What are you searching for? Information. Wisdom? Information. Facts. Oh, here? Yes, here or anywhere else I can find it. Are you all right? Yes. She tries to turn Devon against his friends by spouting some false accusations about them. Then she gives him a weapon, too. Devon. You're in terrible danger. What kind of danger? Your friends are not what you think they are. I have work to do. Excuse me. He doesn't seem to be very suggestible. A minor setback. She will not fail the next time. Next, Letha goes to Garth. She tells him that she doesn't think her people will ever come back. Do you trust your friends? Of course I do. But your friend Devin, didn't he steal your woman? Now how could she have known that? I can't imagine Rachel had told her about it. Devin certainly wouldn't have mentioned it. I'm just chalking that up to sloppy writing. You like me, don't you? Duh. Of course he does. Yes. She smiles when he says yes. And again, who could blame him? Dr. Asgard is smiling too. I guess he likes to watch. Then Letha suggests, what if Rachel died or disappeared and Devon decided to steal her? What if he brought them back and they tried to kill me? Now why would they want to do that? Would you protect me? Of course I would. Do you swear it? Yes. gave it to me. Devon? Yes. Wow, she's really working them against each other, isn't she? Phase two. No, Dr. Asgard. You don't trust the evidence of your eyes and ears? There must be more to human nature than mistrust, self-interest, suspicion, eternal loneliness. Study man's history on the home planet as I have. No other conclusion is possible. The answer is not to be found in history alone. Dr. Asgard watches as Letha leads Garth into the room where Rachel is waiting. Rachel appears to be jealous. Where is that mistrust planted by her conversation with Letha earlier?
Meanwhile, Devon is roaming the corridors. He uses his key to enter a small chamber. Why would he go in there? Is it an elevator? Or is it some sort of torture chamber? They should have added some kind of motion cue like those lights they use on the turbo lifts in Star Trek. Or, he could have temporarily lost his balance. He exits into a large room with several of those globular things they use to mark the biospheres. Devon walks between numerous colorful numbered columns that look like supply and waste pipes. As the music starts to increase in pitch and tempo, I'm really anticipating the end of the act. Then a man steps out behind Devon. Devon turns and another man appears behind him. He swings a club and knocks Devon out. And I'm thinking, that's the end of the that's act. One of them. No. We cut to Dr. Asgard, who excitedly punches a button on his console. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of Act 2. Act 3 opens with a view of that monument we saw at the entrance to New Eden. Then, the backdrop of the colony used in the blue screen shot, followed by a fade to the two doctors. Next, we see Letha pouring a few drinks. The camera drops for an under-the-table view and a gratuitous butt shot of Letha walking away as she hands a glass to Garth. Normal 1970s fare. She offers the other one to Rachel, who gets up and walks away. Garth and Rachel bicker, while Letha merely watches and smirks. We cut through another shot of the doctors watching them to Devon, being interrogated by three men and a woman. Where are the rest of them? Who? The invaders, those who would take our land. Who told you they were invaders? They seem to think he is the invader that they had fled. They don't trust each other, and they're wary of whatever Devon tries to tell them. We cut back to Rachel trying to wake a sleeping Garth. Garth! Garth, Devon's not back yet! Please, please, get up and help me find him! She's worried, because Devon isn't back yet. She wants Garth to help find him. Letha tells Rachel that she's part of an experiment. What have you done to us? I merely assisted in some experimental research. I find that odd. Wouldn't telling her possibly skew the outcome of the experiment? Where is the control subject? Rachel sees through Letha's ruse, but Garth seems to be brainwashed. Garth, we've got to find him. Why? Devin is now our enemy. You saw him. You heard him. Don't you understand? We're part of an experiment. That was part of it. I heard him plainly. Devin is now my enemy. Did she put something in that drink? And he seems to be talking with an accent all of a sudden. Overacting? Maybe. It's just a bit too unbelievable for me. Dr. Asgard wants Dr. Tabor to concede, and he'll terminate the experiment. And what will happen to the three subjects? Does it matter? I suppose they, well, whoever survives the confrontation, will each go his own way. And their concern for the Ark? Young men and their dreams of glory. I assure you, Diana, the Ark is no peril whatever. But she's not ready to give up on all of humanity just yet. Meanwhile, Devon tries to convince his captors that Letha is the real enemy. He offered to betray his friends. I didn't! I did not offer to betray my friends. I offered to, to help you expose your enemy. Who would that be? The girl you left behind, Letha. Oh, she was too weak to come with us. Pretty child, but each of us already had one. She first talked about the invader, didn't she? We all did. Who started the rumor? Rumors have no beginning. Of course they do. Now try to remember. She mentioned it first, didn't she? She also said that the invader would be small in number, treacherous and cunning, ready to make fools of us. 
I see she spoke the truth. We will demonstrate to all that he is mortal. When we open the final act with Garth and Rachel looking for Devon, Letha pays a visit to Devon to gloat before he's to be executed. Hello, Devon. Where are they? Your friends? Who else? Are you quite certain they're your friends? Yes. Then why haven't they tried to help you? When we first found you helpless and unable to speak, it was all part of an act, wasn't it? It was part of the experiment. What experiment? An inquiry into the truth about human nature in order to devise a rational program of education. I see. Rachel and Garth somehow make it to that area where the others are plotting against Devon. They watch and listen. We were told that any stranger is the enemy. They must be talking about Devon. If they're convinced he's the enemy, he hasn't got a chance. Are you worried about what they might be doing to him? Then, they argue a bit about Garth's changed attitude. He's fallen for that vixen, Letha. I really had to chuckle when Rachel remarked, You don't want a woman, you want a lapdog. Well, I know what I don't want. I'm going to her. They're tying Devon up in front of what looks like a laser beam emitter. Only actions will convince your people. You want us to trust you. But we're not fools. Only your death will erase their fear. Rachel! Garth! Garth has gone back to find Letha, and Rachel appears to be afraid to step forward. Letha reports in to the docks. Her assignment is completed, but she feels uneasy about what she's done. There's a... a sadness, a... a melancholy I... I just can't seem to shake off. Then, Garth shows up and wants to know what assignment. What assignment? Oops. What a fool he's been. Falling for a pretty face and a curvy body in a miniskirt and go-go boots. Garth runs off to help his friend before it's too late. Garth eventually rushes in with his crossbow and he confronts those others. Release him. Are you also one of them? I am his friend. So you've come to die with him. You have no cause to kill him. When Garth offers to take Devon's place, they can't believe it. And neither can a defeated Dr. Asgard. Something went wrong. Well, that was another rather enjoyable episode of The Star Lost. It had a few inconsistencies and some minor plot holes, as I might have mentioned, but overall it was a very interesting storyline and it featured an excellent cast. And who hasn't been led astray by a pretty girl in a miniskirt and go-go boots? Am I right? I hope the rest of the episodes are as interesting as these last few have been because I don't remember the series being this good when I watched it 50 years ago. If you'll remember to like, subscribe, and comment below, I'll see you on my next reminiscence of The Star Lost.